Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This week we talked about the platypus because when I was uh, at my mom and dad's house for Thanksgiving, there was this Jeopardy rerun on. The, there was the final Jeopardy question that was about the platypus and I emailed myself an email message from my parents' couch that just said platypus in the subject line so I would remember when I got back to work that I wanted to do a podcast about that. And then I was like, you know, I don't know if that's going to be enough for a whole episode by itself. And I sent myself a second email that just said, also coelacanth in the subject line. Um, But it did turn out to be enough for a whole episode by itself, so we did not talk about coelacanth. No, but maybe later. Maybe that share at some point there will probably be some coelacanth discussion. One never knows. Um, I had promised to mention my first exposure to a platypus, Mm -hmm. which evidences the tiny skeptic I was even at the age of six, which is that it came up for the first time in first grade, and I said to my first grade teacher, Mrs. Hill, you are trying to trick us. Like, (laughs) I thought this was one of those, like, gotcha moments of education where they were, like, going to send us down a path and go, ha-ha, none of you thought to ask, is this real? Because sometimes teachers do stuff like that. It's like when they give you the worksheet that the last thing at the bottom of the worksheet says, turn this paper over and write your name on the back. Right. Because the instruction was to read the whole thing first. Right. I thought it was a big fat trick, and I was yeah, um, doing the squinty eyes of suspicion. And when I went home that night, I looked it up in the encyclopedia, and then I saw it. But, you know, I understand how people buy into conspiracy theories, because part of me was sure. like, again, six. Um, maybe she somehow planted this evidence. Like I was ready to. <laughs> I just and I love whole. I love that teacher. I had no reason to be so very uh, mm-hmm. loaded with doubt about it, but I was. It took a little while. Yeah, I don't remember what finally convinced me. <laughs> yeah, I. I don't remember my reaction to seeing a a picture of a platypus for the first time, but when I was a kid, I was really, really into dinosaurs. And there are so many dinosaurs that have, like, weird head crests and duck bills and strange frills around their bodies that I might have just rolled with it. Like, I probably thought it was some kind of (laughs) dinosaur. That's valid. (laughs) Um, Maybe so. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I love a platypus because they now are, to me, a symbol of the absurdity of all things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, let's stick some pieces together and see what happens. Cool. Yeah. (laughs) And they've they've become kind of a national symbol for Australia. We didn't really talk about that in in the episode. I have no idea what their temperament is like. I was really just looking at their physiology, but like... I kind of want to cuddle one. I know they have claws on their feet. They probably, if they didn't appreciate being cuddled, they'd let you know that. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I just kind of, maybe it's because it's just I want to pick up all animals They're very and cute. cuddle them. They're very yeah. cute. I understand the urge. Um, yeah. 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 In my head, I want them to be much bigger. Like, yeah. I want them to be, um, you know, the size of a small to medium dog. I want like a mm-hmm. really big platypus to walk around with. <laughs> I remember being disappointed when I discovered they were fairly petite. Yeah, they're they're pretty small animals. So anyway, this was definitely a fun episode in the same way that the Piltdown Man episode had been, although that one was also infuriating because the you know, somebody had made up this hoax with the Piltdown Man and it had wasted a whole bunch of scientific time. And this was more, it, it was a long process before the the European scientific community agreed on what was up with the platypus. So while there was a lot of writing that was um, kind of weird and on the wrong track, it it was moving toward an understanding rather than 
going down the wrong track for an extended period of time. So uh, it did not have the angering layer <laughs> of uh, a lot of the reading for the Piltdown Man had. Um, and I forgot that I had talked in that episode about how much I had enjoyed doing the research on it until I just re-listened to it uh, while making sure that we didn't make any gigantic mistakes in it before making it a Saturday classic. We talked about Cyrano de Bergerac this week. We did. I didn't pronounce it that way at all, though. I didn't in the episode because it's... Cyrano, um, it's a, like I said at the beginning of that one, I get real spitty if I say it that way all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who, uh, as you had said, you did not even realize for quite a while was a real person. Well, and I really do think that I read something that he wrote in college but my brain just didn't retain the information. What? You don't memorize every single piece of information you come in contact with? <laughs> what? 20 years ago. Um, and so, like, because, like we talked about in the in the episode, there are so many fictionalized depictions of him. I really just, in my head, he had settled into a fictional character from probably novels that were then made into movies. is sort of how my brain constructed who Cyrano de Bergerac was. Uh, and most of them involved a character having a very big nose and being in love with somebody named Roxanne. Um, and that's my brain. My, right. How my brain just sort of boiled that down. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, no one can blame you. I think probably most people feel that way. I mean, the thing is, right, like the Cyrano story, this idea of loving someone... And I, of which I mean the play, not his real life. Sure, this idea sure. of loving someone, thinking they will reject you because of how you look, and, you know, this secondary love interest who is beautiful using your words to woo someone. It's so common in our world. Obviously, there have been, you know, many, many instances of it. But, like, to me, where I notice it's so common is that, like, it is a a plot line that shows up in sitcoms. It was a Bob's mm. Burgers episode. I mean, <laughs> which um, Linda calls a Cyrano de Bergerac, which is one of the most brilliant turns of phrase on the planet in my world. Um, right? I Like, it's that idea of, like, being enamored of someone and being afraid they will reject you is so common to everybody. I think that's why, mm-hmm. like, that play has endured for so long. Um <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it, it's like our modern mythology, right? That's why you could easily go, no, that's not a real person. That's a story that... Yeah. Well, and we've talked about other other real people who seem like fictional characters and people even remember as, like, one of the first episodes that I ever wrote for the show many, many years ago was on Johnny Appleseed. Yeah. Real person. But a lot of people are like, that's a real person. The other thing that surprised me somehow... Uh, in addition to having either never really remembered or forgotten that he was a real person, uh, was that this was in the 17th century. Somehow that never, that, I was like, oh, really? But I probably, because the play was from the 19th century. Yeah, and is very Victorian in its, its, um, themes and its, you know, the way it's written. Um, yeah, it's very much the Victorian ideal of a man who is both full of bravado and very sensitive. Um, so, <laughs> mm. so that's like one of the, you know, uh, key figures of of that sort of character that is, again, why people uh, kind of gravitate to him and, and identify with the Cyrano of that story. I suspect the real Cyrano may have been a little more difficult to identify with in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, he seemed very fascinating and kind of like a lot. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, and pretty pretty neat. Um, there's a, a whole side party that we didn't get into because it's really not germane to the Cyrano story, but there was like a whole side drama with that head of the college that he satirized, Mm -hmm. uh, Granger. And like, we mentioned that there had been scandals around him, but one of the scandals around him was so fascinating to me because it was that 
he had apparently for quite some time had an affair with a woman who like worked in the school in some sort of like menial role, like as a cleaning woman or something. And everyone knew it and it was not an issue. But then he married her, which also was not an issue, but where people got mad and it became a scandal was that he tried to introduce her to society as his wife in a way that would be like equal to him in social standing and people lost their minds. No. (laughs) Which is evidence is so many problems but i was just like fascinated by that it t- that whole drama could be its own new version of Cyrano de Bergerac that we romanticize and write a play about um there are a million the other thing i wanted to mention that we did not i did not bring up here you will sometimes see Cyrano as also having the first name of hercule maybe <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I uh I didn't didn't bother to include it because we would have buzzed right past it because it's not one that stuck mm-hmm. in his constant mode of of reinvention. I did read a thing and I it's not a thing you can really fact check, uh, but I read one assertion that like his friends, his close friends, would have called him by his name Savigny, which he was born with but that he would have always introduced himself not with that name, but with Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, which is a just a fascinating little tidbit. Yeah. If you time travel and meet him, you could call him that, and he'll think you're a friend. <laughs> Should we briefly mention that there's a new movie, just so folks know that we know? It's yes. A new movie. Yeah. There is a new movie. There might be more information about it coming. We'll see. <laughs> On this very program. Uh, yeah, keep your ears peeled. That's all I'll say there. Um, yes, Cyrano. The Cyrano story. Do you have a favorite version of the Cyrano story in in film or oh, television? I, well, so or, the, other than Bob's Burgers, which I love maybe the most. <laughs> I think the one that I probably have the most familiarity with is the movie Roxanne. Of course. I don't remember what year that came out, but that's a movie that I saw in theaters. Um, Let's look. I was going to say, my brain wants to say 93, but I don't know that I trust that. 1987. Yeah. Um, So we're talking about a period in my life. uh, I would be 12. So at an age to be having crushes on people and very self-conscious about my appearance. Um, So, uh, that's probably why. (laughs) (laughs) There was also, uh, just a few years after that, in 1990, was the Chirard de Pardieu version of Cyrano. Which I remember uh, being, I was working in college in the summers in a costume shop, and I remember all of the women that I was working with getting the vapors discussing Gerard de Padieu in that role. And it oh, was, yeah. I, I have such a strong memory of that discussion and how delightful and funny it was that um, it will stick with me forever. But really, until you've seen Tina Belcher do it, you haven't seen <laughs> sure. the Cyrano Bergerac story. <laughs> Which is not true. All of that is a very good one. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the good thing, right? If you are into the story, there's plenty to he- to watch. Keep you busy. Yeah. Catalog them all. We hope that you have enjoyed this week with us and that as you head into your weekend, that it is filled with some rest and relaxation or at least very smooth sailing if you don't have t- downtime to yourself. In any case, we will be right back here tomorrow with a classic and then... We'll see you again on Monday with brand new stuff. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 